uh, superbugs tackling resistant organisms, including NDM1 and MRSA. The goal of this uh, session before lunch is to actually um, get you thinking about topical antimicrobial interventions or, or antiseptic interventions. This morning we've talked about antibiotics, antiseptics and antimicrobials, so this session is dedicated to non-antibiotics and focusing in on the uh, area of wound care to show how uh, antiseptics can help hopefully prevent the, uh, the cost associated with the human and economic costs associated with wound care. So as part of an introduction, everybody shows a historic slide. This one, really, the point to, to kind of put across is before antibiotics, if you looked at carbolic acid or if you looked at semmelweis with hand washing, antiseptic agents were seen as, as interventions and certainly helped in controlling infections. And even Paul Ehrlich in 1913, his message of frappe for, frappe vit, hit hard, hit fast, bear that kind of concept in mind when you listen to the two uh, eminent speakers we, we have coming on in a minute. Because when one looks at antiseptics, which are non-antibiotics and antibiotics, they are slightly different in, in, in terms of uh, how they work in terms of possibly uh, the antiseptics having more targets, so multiple targets to hit. If you look at resistance and publications on resistance to antiseptics, they're very few compared to what we see with the challenges of associated with antibiotic use. And that's good use as well as uh, misuse of antibiotics. Think about sidle activity. Think about speed of kill, because I think this will be a theme through the, uh, the, the next two presentations. You know, static versus sidle, and should you as healthcare professionals expect rapid speed of kill, and how does that reflect in the clinical outcomes you see? And I have put a question mark with the antiseptics, the last comment. You know, we talk about stewardship, we talk about good use of antibiotics, and we should talk about good use of antiseptics because they both come together under this umbrella of stewardship, especially in the area of wound care. And again, we talk about wound care, we talk about breaches of the skin. It was highlighted this morning how uh, insertion sites with IV cannula can be quite uh, high uh, sources of bacteremia. So even simple techniques do better than what we do now in terms of some of these so-called wounds, even simple wounds, can be a mainstay in terms of uh, helping reduce healthcare-acquired infections. So let's think about wounds, let's think about combination therapies, antibiotics and antibacterial agents, Think about speed of kill and think about stewardship. And hoping now, in terms of wound care, uh, for potency, another term, that strength and that speed of kill, is not an option in this microbiologically challenged world. A lot of these organisms have been mentioned this morning. And again, if you look at uh, the NDM1 strains and, and, and MRSA, they'll be dealt with by the next two speakers. So from, as a medical microbiologist, you know, one can ask yourself, why is speed of kill important? If you look at E. coli in a laboratory, it divides every 20 minutes, can go from a cell to over a million cells in under seven hours. In vivo, I found one paper looking at Staph aureus, can go from one cell to, uh, is it 100,000 cells in under eight hours. That level is critically colonization if you go by the definition. So again, speed of kill is important because these bacteria can be very, very invasive. And with necrotizing fasciitis, you can go from this to this in under 48 hours. Now, this is post-surgical debridement. But again, the surgeon has to keep ahead of the bacteria. And so we're left with a very high-risk surface where potency in terms of wound coverage is an important part of our uh, therapeutic options. And we're going to talk about silver today and talk about a specific kind of silver Silver's been around for a long time and has moved in terms of the original thoughts of frequency of application, if you look at some of the, the creams for burns you apply daily, because the release of silver and reaching those levels to be bactericidal and potent, uh, you need to have frequent application because the delivery system is not so good. And we're going to talk about a specific delivery system today, Silchris technology, which is associated with the Acticode family of dressings, this is the wound contact layer, so this coral reef-like structure is unique and gives you the levels of silver release that are considered to be potent in terms of bactericidal activity. So that was my kind of introduction to get you thinking about these topics, and it gives me great pleasure to uh, introduce uh, Professor Alan Johnson for the first talk.
who's consultant clinical scientist and deputy head of the Department of Healthcare Associated Infections and Antibiotic Resistance and the Healthcare Protection Agency Center of Infections. Whew. He also, if I'd have continued, would have taken up half his talk. So I'm going to leave it there and invite him to share some new work on NDM1 and potency attached to certain silver delivery systems. So, Alan, thank you. Uh, thank you. What I'm going to do in the uh, presentation this morning is very, uh, start by very briefly reviewing how bacteria become resistant to antibiotics. I'll then briefly address the issue of how use of antibiotics promotes the emergence and spread of antibiotic resistance. And then I'll go into issues about how we can try to tackle the problem. Um, antibiotics are drugs that uh, are selectively toxic for bacteria. And this is because they bind to unique targets found in bacteria that are essential for metabolic processes, processes for keeping bacteria alive. And by binding to these unique targets, um, they interfere with the metabolism of the cells, which means that the bacteria uh, die uh, or, or at least stop growing. And in order to become resistant, bacteria simply have to find, come up with mechanisms for uh, preventing the antibiotic binding to the target site. Um, well, they're wily little beasts, and in fact, they have a whole range of mechanisms for doing this. Uh, for antibiotics that work by getting inside the cell, if the target is, for example, an enzyme, um, they can change the permeability of the cell wall such that the antibiotic can no longer get in. Uh, in some instances, they actually have what we call efflux pumps, which work to pump the antibiotic out of the bacteria as fast as they're getting in. It's a bit like if you're on a rowing boat and you spring a leak and you're basically bailing out. Um, a common mechanism involves uh, enzymatic modification or, or inactivation of the antibiotic, and we see this certainly with the penicillin group of antibiotics and also with aminoglycosides. Um, another mechanism is that if you can change the structure of the target site such that it will still be able to maintain its essential metabolic function but no longer bind the antibiotic, uh, this would also give you resistance. Now, intuitively, I think that's probably highly unlikely, but the reality is that it's a phenomenally common mechanism of resistance. So, as I say, they're clever little beasts uh, that they can do this. And a, another example of that is what's called metabolic bypass. Uh, this is where, uh, resistance we see with trimethoprim and sulfonamide, um, where they have the normal enzymes which are inhibited by the antibiotic, but the bacteria simply produce a second type of enzyme which doesn't bind the antibiotic and still works. So, they, it's what we call metabolic bypass. Um, in terms of the spread of antibiotic resistance, we've obviously, obviously got the issue of patient-to-patient -patient spread, but superimposed upon this, we have the added difficulty that the genes that encode the resistance are also capable of independent spread. Um, now, I apologise for this slide. It's a bit early in the day for this sort of thing, but this is an aerial photograph of bacteria having sex. Um, and essentially, what we've got is we've got the donor bacterium, which is a, a resistant strain here, and it produces this filamentous hollow fibre called a sex pilus that makes physical contact with the recipient cell. And then a copy of the gene, often in the form of a plasmid, uh, then transfers down this hollow tube, is taken up by the recipient strain, and this recipient strain then becomes antibiotic resistant. And this could be two different strains of the same species, or particularly worrying, it could be two totally different species of bacteria. And so you're actually getting the resistance spreading between different strains. And we think this can be happening quite commonly in the gut, where there are large numbers of bacteria in close proximity to each other, allowing uh, the resistance genes to spread. So in terms of control, it, it can be quite a complex problem. Um, Antibiotic use has now become a critical component of the management of, of patients in many areas of medicine. Uh, because one of the problems is that most advances in modern medicine have as a side effect that you produce populations of patients who are uh, at increased likelihood of developing infections. Um, if you have invasive procedures, so for example putting catheters into either the bloodstream or into the, into the bladder, that gives you a direct entry portal for bacteria from either the skin or mucosal surfaces or the external environment getting direct access into the body of the patient. And obviously by definition with surgery, when you incise the skin, uh, you are going through the major defence mechanism that, that wards off infection. Um, similarly, immunosuppression, uh, obviously cancer patients receiving cytotoxic or, or, chemo, um, or radiation therapy, 
uh, have as a side effect and that their immune system uh, is affected. And a lot of cancer patients may succumb to uh, neutropenic sepsis uh, as opposed to the cancer itself actually killing them. And similarly, transplant patients uh, have to be immunosuppressed to prevent rejection of the organ. And again, this predisposes the patients to infection. So there are many areas of mod modern medicine where we are dependent on using antibiotics, either prophylactically or therapeutically, as part of the management. And this, of course, um, generates huge amounts of antibiotic use. Now, antibiotics are a unique class of drugs in that the more you use them, the greater the risk of them becoming useless. And the problem is that, by the mechanisms I've described, in the face of widespread antibiotic usage, uh, resistant strains have a strong selective advantage. Essentially, it's a, an extreme form of Darwinian evolution with survival of the fittest. And the bottom line is that following exposure to antibiotics, uh, the susceptible cells are killed off, but any resistant variants uh, will survive. Uh, now, we have a huge number of antibiotics licensed for clinical use. These are just listing the major classes. And if you go, for example, with the beta-lactams, there's huge numbers of subgroups. There's all the different cephalosporins, penicillins, carbapenems, and so on. So the total um, number of drug-bug combinations that we would need to consider if you're going to look at the full burden of antimicrobial resistance is vast and clearly can't be covered in the course of a very short lecture. Um, so I've been asked to focus, and particularly asked to focus, on the area of wound care and skin soft tissue infections, which is my first dilemma in that we have a real paucity of surveillance data relating to resistance in this area. Uh, however, we do have some data um, which is going to be quite helpful, and certainly we can infer various things as to what may be going on from it. Um, I should stress that we are actually hoping to start some new initiatives with surveillance of resistance uh, in surgical site infections in the not-too-distant future. Um, this is data from a point prevalence survey that was undertaken in 2006. And of course, many of you will be aware that there is another pan-European point prevalence survey that has taken place this year. So it will be of interest to see what's happening currently. But from this data from, from 2006, um, essentially a quarter of uh, healthcare associated infections uh, were either surgical site infections or other skin and soft tissue infections. So clearly a considerable burden of clinical disease uh, with these sorts of infections. Um, we have quite a bit of data on the etiology from mandatory surveillance that's carried out by the Health Protection Agency. And this is aggregate data for uh, skin and soft tissue infections or surgical site infections between 2003 and 2007. Uh, with various organisms. So clearly there's a range of organisms. Uh, but again, it's the usual suspects who do tend to crop up with some 38% of infections being caused by Staphylococcus aureus uh, and a further fifth of the f infections being oops, excuse me, fifth of infections being due to Enterobacteriaceae. Um, what's particularly interesting here is that over that time period, uh, data from surveillance of bacteremia indicated that um, MRSA uh, peaked at being a, uh, approximately 40% of Staph aureus infections uh, with a decline from uh, 2005 onwards. Um, interestingly, over the same time period uh, for surgical site infections, we're seeing 63% of Staph aureus being methicillin resistant. So there clearly are differences in the levels of antibiotic resistance that we're seeing in different, different clinical settings. And I think it will be quite fascinating if we can get surveillance going with surgical site infections in general. Um, and this is aggregate data on etiology. Um, obviously, this is not a static phenomenon, and the causative organisms do vary over time. And this is longitudinal data from 2000 through to 2010, uh, looking at causative organisms. And you see there are changes. So we're seeing um, a slight decrease in Staph aureus, which in large part is actually due to a differential decrease in the number of infections caused by MRSA, which have really quite uh, significantly declined. And this very much reflects what we're seeing in the bacteremia mandatory surveillance as well. Um, interestingly, um, the methicillin-susceptible Staph aureus uh, are, are remaining relatively constant. So there is something, there's a differential effect going on with what we're seeing with MRSA versus MSSA. But I think the thing that perhaps causes us some degree of concern is the right, excuse me, is the rise in the uh, Enterobacteriaceae, with these now being the commonest pathogens associated with surgical site infections, uh, causing about 29%. And we do know from surveillance on bacteremia that we're seeing quite marked problems with gram-negative pathogens. Um, these are data for E. coli from bacteremia, where approximately um, about 10% of the isolates have got cephalosporin resistance, 
and about twice that level of resistance to ciprofloxacin. So clearly quite significant problems in terms of resistance. It will vary with different species of Enterobacteria ACE. So, for example, Enterobacters, um, it's really a reflection of their genetic makeup, that they have a particular propensity to develop uh, cephalosporin resistance during treatment. Uh, and it's perhaps totally unsurprising that something of the order of about a third of Enterobacter infections uh, exhibit uh, res resistance to third generation cephalosporins, although the uh, superfloxacin resistance rates in the species are quite a bit lower than those seen with E. coli. So there will be variation with the different pathogens and I think it's something for, for, for wound and uh, skin infections we do need to get a better handle on what's happening there. Um, because of the problems we've been seeing with um, resistance to cephalosporins and quinolones there has been a shift towards increasing uh, levels of usage of um, carbapenems and Jonathan Cook referred to that in his presentation <coughs> earlier this morning. And of course, not unexpectedly, we're seeing a compensatory rise in submission of isolates to the uh, reference lab, which are showing degrees of carbapenem resistance due to the production of carbapenemase. And one that's particularly hit the headlines uh, over the last 18 months is the one referred to as NDM1. This is the New Delhi metallobetalactamase, uh, so-called, in that um, the first isolates were actually epidemiologically linked to the Indian subcontinent, and a study published by some of my colleagues in Lancet Infectious Disease showed that a significant proportion of the first cases seen in the UK all appeared to have been imported from the Indian subcontinent due to patient transfers. Uh, a number of the patients actually going to India for cosmetic surgical procedures, which they then became infected, and when they, they were repatriated to the UK and brought their nasty germs with them. Um, it's caused something of a political uh, storm because the, the Indian government has actually accused uh, the British of trying to undermine their medical tourism industry. And so rather than being um, primarily concerned with the fact they have a major public health problem in India with highly resistant gram-negative pathogens, um, the politicians are getting more bogged down in trying to apportion blame and trying to make out it's some sort of cons conspiracy. So sorry, I'm having a little rant um, there. Um, but what's particularly a problem with these, if you look at the overall antibiotic profile of some of the NDM producers, they are highly multi-resistant. So we're actually looking at not only resistance to the beta lactams, which you'd expect, but um, we've got 92% of the isolates resistance to ciprofloxacin, only 8% susceptible, 97% resistance to gentamicin, complete resistance to other aminoglycosides, complete resistance to other drugs out of desperation that you might want to try, like minocycline. Um, tigercycline and colistin are currently regarded as drugs that you would give serious consideration to using, but even here um, we have got uh, something you ruled about 10 or 11% of resistance to colistin and um, only 64% of isolates remaining susceptible to, to tigercycline. And there have been some isolates which are completely pan-resistant. Fortunately, as far as I'm aware, those have been, patients have been colonised, but if they get infections, we have actually literally run out of treatment options. So this is a significant cause for concern. So I think the thing is that we do need to be looking at alternatives to antibiotics, simply out of necessity that we may simply not have antibiotics to use in the future, but also in terms of our strategies to reduce antibiotic use, which will reduce the selective pressure and perhaps at least slow down the rate of increase. And so I think increasingly people should be thinking in terms of um, uh, non-antibiotic antimicrobials. And one such example here um, to be considered is silver. Um, this is some work uh, that undertaken by some of my colleagues in the HBA, and I'm, I'm indebted to my colleagues Russell Hope and David Livermore for uh, allowing me to present their unpublished data. Um, they undertook some studies looking at five isolates uh, that produced NDM1. Uh, there were five different species, so they had an Acinetobacter baumannii, Citrobacter freundii, an Enterobacter, an E. coli and the Klebsiella pneumoniae. So these are all highly resistant organisms uh, which patients do really do not want to be getting infections with. And they tested the susceptibility um, of these isolates to three proprietary nanocrystalline silver dressings. Um, the methodology involved taking samples of the dressings which were inoculated with a suspension of bacteria uh, containing uh, 1 times 10 to the 7, so that's 10 million colony forming units per mil, so that's about half a million organisms being laid onto the surface of the dressing. Uh, and then uh, the material was washed off and viable counts were undertaken at the start of the experiment, uh, half an hour, uh, two hours and four hours um, in terms of the surviving numbers of organisms. 
And I have to say the results are really quite striking in that all three silver dressings achieved a greater than four log uh, to the base 10 reduction in bacterial count within 30 minutes for all five strains. Uh, now, there is a well-known brand of antiseptic, and they use the slogan in their adverts, kills 99% of all household germs. Um, we're actually looking at not greater than 99.99%, uh, so that is a significant level of killing in a remarkably short period of time. Uh, so I, I think all the in indications are if that's actually happening in the patients who are using the dressings, um, this is a really a very serious alternative to antibiotics for treatment of um, potential wound, wound infections. Uh, and it clearly does work against multi-resistant organisms. Um, now, all of these were gram-negatives, but the activity is not limited just to gram-negative pathogens. Um, this is some data from uh, Alex O'Neill and Ian Chopper and their colleagues at the University of Leeds, uh, presented, I think it was at EGMID last year, who've done some work with um, Silver and Staphylococcus aureus. And they've attempted to actually work out the mode of action of Silver against pathogens. And essentially, their data is clearly indicating that um, the silver works by um, interfering with membrane integrity because this can be measured by having a loss of potassium ions and uh, maintaining the electrochemical potential at the bacterial uh, cell membrane is essential for, for continued cell viability and this does clearly give some insight into how the antibiotics are working. Um, what was particularly interesting was that they also looked at the propensity of bacteria to uh, develop resistance to silver following prolonged incubation, and they were not able to detect any resistant mutants being found. And again, um, we, I mean, objectively, we have been down that road with some antibiotics where preclinical studies have not shown resistance to emerge readily, but then it does crop up in clinical practice. But clearly, uh, I think with silver, this, this clearly is very encouraging. Um, I also think it's important that if the silver is in fact working at the level of the cell membrane, and I must stress this is just sheer speculation on my part, it may well mean that the uh, silver ions don't need necessarily to get inside the cell, which means that things like e uh, efflux and so on may possibly not be important. But again, further what will be needed to see if um, that's complete nonsense or not, as a speculation on my part. So I think sil silver compounds, as one example of an antibacterial, non-antibiotic compound, um, do appear to provide a viable alternative to antibiotics. Um, in the current climate, with increasing levels of antibiotic resistance, um, a real paucity of new antibiotics and development pipeline, um, increasing attention is being paid to antimicrobial stewardship with a view to at least slowing down the rate of increase of resistance um, that we're seeing, if not, if not being able to actually reverse it. Um, a lot of the antimicrobial stewardship does focus on which antibiotics to use when, but I think really we should be thinking in a broader context and thinking that if we really want to reduce unnecessary use of antibiotics, we should be looking, looking at alternative strategies. And I do think things like antiseptic dressings such as silver uh, may provide one mechanism for doing that. And, uh, yep, that was me done. Thank you. Um, our next speaker takes us on the journey from the laboratory to the bedside. And it's, a, it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, Heather Newton, whose CV is equally as voluminous as, uh, as Alan's. But Heather has had an interest in wound care for many years, has become a tissue uh, viability specialist nurse at Royal Cornwall Hospitals, and on the national circuit certainly is a keynote speaker in all aspects of, of wound care. Also, she will take us on that journey from recognising a problem through surveillance to implementing a holistic strategy for infection control. So, Heather, please. Thank you, and good afternoon, everybody. Um, this is really a very sort of personal journey, um, and it involved really a very multi-professional approach. So, you know, I can't stress enough that I'm presenting this, but actually uh, there is a whole team involvement here, as many of you have probably found out. But it is um, the clinical journey about reducing MRSA bacteremias. And I think this morning's pre presentation, certainly from Alan, set the scene very nicely about the issues that we had in clinical practice way back in the sort of 2006 to 2008 um, with the increase in MRSA bacteremia specifically. So this is uh, really my story. As we all know, uh, and it was highlighted again this morning, that MRSA is all of our responsibility. It's, it's not a cop-out. It's really anybody engaged in healthcare and managing patients um, in any clinical setting has a responsibility to reduce and prevent patients from harm. And the harm-free agenda is really high on certainly the national profile now uh, on the agenda. 
And many factors influence a patient's susceptibility to develop MRSA, and we'll just look at those briefly a bit later on. And also, many factors influence a healthcare respons a professional's responsibility to prevention um, and management, such as the knowledge and skills of the workforce, communicating strategies, access to treatments, and access to specialist advice. Just a brief overview, because I only have 15 minutes, and you can appreciate that this uh, topic is very large. Um, MRSA can be isolated from wounds that appear to be healing normally, and as, as such, represents quite a serious um, risk of cross-infection if appropriate infection control techniques are not employed at all times. And in 2006, the Department of Health, through detailed analysis of MRSA causes, um, founded that 10% of bacteremias were likely to be attributed to chronic wound infection, so a significant risk to our patients. So just going to share the experience of the Royal Cornwall Hospital, um, it was identified through surveillance that an increased number of patients had developed MRSA bacteremias. It was at this stage where surveillance was um, in place, but we were a little bit slow on the uptake, and um, so it took sort of to 2008 to identify the real um, significance of the problem, um, and also about our root cause analysis investigations, they were getting more robust and identified um, specific patients, and we had a, quite a large number, um, we had 12 that were associated with their wound, and that was pretty significant. And I actually think on the graph that we saw this morning, even though you couldn't see all the trusts, we were one of the highest. So it was a significant problem for us, and I will admit that now, because we're probably one of the lowest now. The national target at this stage was to achieve a 60% reduction, but it did vary depending on the level of bacteremias that you had. However, the oper national operating framework now uh, details a zero tolerance to all preventable healthcare associated infections in the NHS, and as I said, this provision of harm-free care. The local strategy was therefore to introduce a sustainable whole systems approach to reducing the bacteremias with true multi-professional engagement. As we all know, working in a healthcare arena, it's hard to do it alone. This was a list of the bacteremias from April to December in 2008. And as you can see, wounds were one of the highest. But if you take into account the cellulitis, the podiatry infected feet, and the leg ulcers, um, I think that makes 12 or 13 there. So significant problem. We'd actually reduced the uh, peripheral line um, sites and did really well because that was the initial driver, as in most organisations. But actually, wounds were not um, deemed to be um, an important element of uh, the pre pre prevention at that stage until they were seen through root cause analysis to be a problem. So our key issues were the high number of patients with the bacteremias. And actually, when we looked at the and reviewed um, those patients, none of those had been screened. So they were all patients that were really not, it was the unknown. There was no routine scrub it, swabbing or screening within the organisation as part of the culture. Um, I did a very quick snapshot audit, and it wasn't rocket science. It was just have a quick look, as we often have to do. Um, so there were 31% of the inpatients had wounds at that stage. And looking at the number of risk factors that we know influence the, the risk of developing um, infection, there were 43 of these patients that, because of their underlying condition, their medical comorbidities, such as the ones detailed there, they were at risk of developing an infection, let alone a sort of bacteremia that could have progressed. So it literally was a snapshot. Um, we didn't ever audit our wound care techniques. Um, and there was a lack of available wound dressing, dressings within the clinical area and the knowledge of staff. Um, wards kept their own stocks of dressings, and they didn't always have antimicrobial dressings um, available at the time for them. And as we've already heard, speed is of the essence um, in these cases. And prescribing practice, as we all know, the use of antibiotics were no clinical indication. And our microbiology lab staff did um, a review of patients with leg ulcers and found that most of the data was missing when uh, leg ulcer swabs were sent in for processing. And they didn't really know um, what was on the end of a swab. I did a presentation to the microbiology staff, and it, they were fascinated at what was swabbed, what type of wounds were swabbed, and where they shouldn't shouldn't be. So it was nice for them to see the other side of the story. But in fact, they had no um, sort of confirmation that actually wounds were being swabbed appropriately. And I think that was the significant um, area to be looked at as well. So as part of the MRSA strategy, as I said, it was a whole systems approach with multi-professional engagement. 
We need to look at those patients that were at higher, higher risk and also the routine elective cases. And the government put in a very clear programme for the surveillance and for the actions. We looked at swabbing techniques and processes. Although there was no real evidence about how to swab, um, we identified, the, and certainly through national data, um, which patients needed swabbing. The screening included the wounds as well, so those patients that um, were known to be, have MRSA um, included their, the wounds were for swabbing. And also, for those patients that demonstrated um, significant signs of clinical infection, we also um, swabbed for other um, organisms, because as we know, it's not just MRSA that's present in wounds, there are other organisms that may need specific treatment. Um, with this um, intent, the Department of Health um, identified that action on MRSA would actually have the impact of reducing um, other infections as well, and this clearly fitted in with our strategy. Flowcharts were developed, and I'm a sort of flowchart queen. I like to know where you're starting and where you're finishing, and um, it's really simple if you have it in a flowchart. So we did a, I developed a flowchart for those patients who um, were had who were being screened for um, MRSA when they were admitted to hospital or those that were coming in well, for surgery and those that were admitted uh, as an emergency and also those that were known to have clinical infection as well. So there were different flow charts because the treatments varied slightly. Patients were decolonised prior to elective admission, which was a part of the strategy, and during admission if they were found to be <coughs> MRSA positive, those that were um, acutely admitted and were swabbed. Staff education was a huge agenda, getting through everybody through mandatory training and competency in ANTT and recognising that hand washing and their aseptic non-touch techniques were really, really key to driving this agenda forward. It's not just about application of dressings, it's not just about recognition, it's about understanding your um, techniques, clinical techniques as well. And then also the use of antimicrobial dressings and their place within the strategy is, um, was an important factor. So positive MRSA patients um, with wounds had the suppression therapy, but also included the use of silver dressings topically onto their wound. Now, those patients that were colonised had the silver dressings for one week, and those that had clinically infected wounds had the silver dressings for two weeks. Acticoat silver dressings were our first line for colonised wounds, and as I've said, one week or two weeks. And the paper by Gago in 2008 identified that studies show that remission of clinical signs occurs between two and four weeks. However, the less time that the antimicrobial treatment is used, the less chance of resistance. So I think it's important to be mindful that if you put um, antimicrobial dressings on, you don't just leave them. And I think part of this smart... Um, sort of profile that's being raised today is about looking and identifying but not just letting something run with, just because you've you started using it so continue. It's really important the reassessment of these patients and the impact of the intervention that you um, introduce. Iodine was used an alternative because not every patient could tolerate silver. We find that in practice antimicrobial dressings can be pa um, painful for some patients. So it's about recognising that and identifying um, how, ways of getting around uh, reducing the pain. And also another key area was looking at um, how we manage the silver dressing stock. As a single cost, we identify that you know, to have a silver dressing as opposed to a non-adherent dressing is more expensive, but it's about the cost-effective argument and the whole argument about reducing costs for the whole of that patient episode of care, not just in isolation. And I think sometimes as organisations we're not that good at looking at the whole cost. It's always broken down to individual elements of that cost. And um, I think certainly with managing um, MRSA colonised and infected um, wound patients, then it's about a whole systems approach. So the dressing stock was cent centrally managed and we... Um, we have an equipment library that I managed, and that was quite useful because we centralised all high-cost, low-use dressings, and silver came into that dressing, that um, equipment library. So we managed every dressing that went out, and the patients only got far, uh, enough dressings for the week or for the two weeks, depending on what their clinical indicators were, and we could look at the costs um, overall. So why silver? I think this has been talked about really. It had a low side effect profile, was less likely to mount a defence and survive as resistant strains, and really that's been said. It was about the speed of kill and about the need to really rapidly reduce the bacteria on these wounds. <coughs> 
So through our root cause analysis process, areas were highlighted for improvement and lessons were learned in the overall management of these patients. Um, there were no new cases in the trust. There are still no new cases. There were two community cases. One, I think Alan alluded to this as well, that the transplant patients, this lady had um, multiple basal cell carcinoma from head to foot, and she unfortunately developed a bacteremia. Um, her risks were so high. And the other one was a podiatry diabetic patient, diabetic foot patient, which again, um, there are instances and cases where in this uh, particular group of patients, they're at risk. There now is a clear pathway for management of wounds with MRSA, very managed approach to the use of silver dressings, and increased knowledge, skills, and understanding of the workforce. These are the, this is the data for 2009 to 2010, and I'm sure that looking at the national data and then probably reflecting on your own data, these are the outcomes that you found in practice, but really significant um, outcomes. Um, I asked my infection control team about... Um, what they felt was one of the key things for the sustainability and they felt that the uh, risk factors in primary care were important and patients that come into hospital are swabbed but it's about what happens in primary care and these patients now uh, patients that come onto the caseload are assessed and if they have four, more than four of the risk factors they're offered um, screening and then offered suppression if they're positive and the community team feels that this is a significant way forward for these patients to identify them early and then manage and treat them effectively. Financial implications just whizzing through. I know this seems really um, crazy figures here, but the cost of a bacteremia is very high, um, and certainly from the quality of life of the patient, it's significantly high as well. But to be proactive and treat with silver dressings can actually not be expensive within the whole scheme of things. So I know 12 patients cost up to 81,000 um, to treat a bacteremia, but 12 patients with silver dressings actually cost just under 800 pounds. So sustainability, it was early identification that really we feel has sustained the program. Um, as I've said, they've offered screening, appropriate treatment with silver dressings, ongoing education and stuff, that continues, it is mandatory. Um, access to silver dressings is still 24 seven, anybody can get at any time, even though it's locked away. High profile from both the infection control and tissue viability nurses working together and also working with the microbiologists, the GPs, the uh, doctors as well um, across the health community. So just to summarise, um, we all have a professional responsibility to ensure that patients are assist consistently offered high quality and safe harm-free care. Wound companies have a responsibility to work with us to support this activity, acknowledging our financial situation, the delivery and provision of healthcare in this changing NHS. We know from the work to date that measures introduced to reduce the MRSA bacteremias in Cornwall have worked and have been sustained. Silver dressings do play an important role in managing infected and colonised wounds. However, they should be in used in, in conjunction with good infection control practices early risk reduction and increased patient and public awareness. And for the patient, the real impact of MRSA should not be underestimated. Patients have increased length of stays, they feel ostracised, they can't get into residential homes or the nursing homes, they're kept in isolation. And sometimes we forget about this, the impact for the patient, but for me, that's why I became a nurse. It's about managing patients and you know, ultimately this whole programme is about providing safe, harm-free care. Thank you very much. My thanks to both speakers for keeping on time, and now the floor is open for any questions. Alan, would you like to join us here, please? The back of the room. My name's Philip. I work at Manchester for the HPA. Um, it's a question for Alan. Um, your graph showed that there's been an increase in um, surgical tissue infections related to Enterobacteriaceae. In light as well of the increase in um, multidrug resistant coliforms, do you think that the UK should be undertaking faecal carriage studies in the same way that hospitals in France do in patients that are about to have gut surgery? Uh, I think actually there is, there is almost certainly a good case for actually uh, <coughs> undertaking faecal carriage studies. Um, there's some recent work actually um, from Birmingham that's just about to be published looking at faecal carriage rates uh, in, in the community um, and there actually is quite interesting that, that different ethnic groups appear to have quite significant differences in the, in the rate of carriage so I think these are, these are the sorts of studies that we really need to be doing because if we can identify which patients may, may be at increased risk of, of carriage 
um, that's going to be a strong marker for knowing how, actually how to manage and, and what to be looking out for. Uh, thank you for your talks. Uh, my name is Matthew Diggle. I'm a, a microbiologist in the Nottingham NHS Trust. It was just really um, a couple of comments and, and your views on those. One is um, we talk about the antimicrobial stewardship, and I think that's very important, and that was in the first presentation. The second presentation referred to training of staff, which, again, I think is really important. One thing I think we're doing there, though, is very much firefighting, and I, I don't, I won't, I'd like to hear, obviously, everybody else's views and your views on how we can really um, do a root cause analysis and train from an early age um, at, at undergraduate level with medics. I know that with infection control and microbiology specifically, there are some undergraduate medical courses which are pretty woeful as far as their uh, uh, training is concerned. And I know that my colleagues and myself, when we get the rotations through of junior doctors, it does strike a little bit of fear in the microbiology department because we do see uh, increased calls and uh, uh, we have to have increased support. So I wondered what, what your views were on that really because um, obviously that is possibly a long-term solution. And the second point, obviously we're talking about MRSA, um, specific for Alan, um, and that is um, uh, we, what's dropped off the radar very much so is vancomycin resistant staph aureus. Have you got any views on its present situation and what the future holds as far as that's concerned? I totally agree that, um, well, certainly within wound care and infection control practices, that's uh, very limited in the undergraduate training. Um, I do pick up the uh, junior doctors, but it, at that stage, they're quite ingrained in their practices, and it's sometimes quite hard um, to, to change their ways. But I do certainly do a regular session on um, wound care and the use of antimicrobials and the reducing MRSA um, Oh, well, and all sort of infections, really. But they are very hungry for that information, I find, that once they've got that knowledge, then they are very keen. And um, certainly um, it's not because they don't want to learn. It's because they just don't have that built into the curriculum. So it's about where and how we can get that built into their curriculum, where everything seems to be a priority at the moment in the NHS. And it's what do you, what do you uh, see as important. But obviously infection control has been a very high political agenda. And I'm surprised it's sort of not been built in really. I mean I would reiterate the issue about, uh, about training of undergraduates in medicine. I mean speaking from a survey of a sample population of one which is my younger son who's recently qualified in medicine, um, antibiotics are not on his radar particularly. It's just one tiny proportion of a vast amount of knowledge which he has to acquire. Um, and it's, it's clearly, uh, I mean I've spoken to him and he said if he has to treat a patient with antibiotics he just gets the trust policy and does what's written down. Um, I don't think he's actually, you know, there's, I think the medics have so much to, to take in during the undergraduate curriculum that I'm not sure they've actually got a lot of time to really think about, you know, what they're doing. It's very much learn and, and, and then put it into practice. So I think there is increased scope either in the early, early postgraduate phase uh, of perhaps strengthening uh, awareness of antimicrobial stewardship and bringing it, bringing it in at that point. Um, I, think, I think it certainly has a role to play. Um, what was the second question about anti and, uh, vancomycin? Um, I mean, the vancomycin resistance has always been something more of a theoretic, that's probably the kiss of death saying this actually, yeah. um, theoretical possibility in that um, we, we, there have been, I think it's still in single figures, um, instances of high level vancomycin resistance transferring from enterococci, where you can get uh, vancomycin resistance or, or glycopeptide resistance to, to MRSA. Um, it appears to be a really very uncommon event. Um, we've never seen any cases in the UK. All the published cases have been in, in the United States. Um, phenomenally low frequency. Um, of the cases where vancomycin resistance has arisen in MRSA, there have not been any documented instances of uh, transmission to other patients. And I think the evidence actually suggests that the strains that acquire vancomycin resistance, there may be some fitness cost which is perhaps why they don't actually establish themselves long-term or, or, or spread. But having said that, um, you know, I, I mean, I'm slightly wary because um, when vancomycin resistance in enterococci first emerged in the late 1980s, somebody wrote a review article in which they said that vancomycin resistance in bacteria in general was a theoretical impossibility. And within six months, we had a major outbreak uh, occurring in the UK. It was the first ever case. So I'm always slightly reluctant to say it's not going to happen. But the, the evidence to date is that there have been lots of patients who are co-colonised or co-infected with, with VRE and, and MRSA. And, and we don't tend to be seeing the resistance genes transferring. So it's very much hoping that it stays that way. 
as, as a medical microbiologist as well, just, just one comment, if I may, that uh, sitting at coffee breaks with, with you guys, you know, you get very excited about next generation cephalosporins. Antiseptics kind of yawn and carry on. And uh, I think with stewardship and this whole area of wounds, the synergies between both and the, the treatment strategies, I think now some of these topical agents, uh, iodine, silvers, whatever, need to be revisited in terms of this, this potency and see how they fit under stewardship. I'm other one sorry, from Barry Valley Hospital in Kent. Uh, we, in order to stop abusing swabs from chronic wounds and ulcers, we establish a wounds policy whereby we do not process, we should really don't process a wound swab if they don't give us clinical information suggesting of acute infection. Please comment. Yeah, no, that's absolutely, that's the same as we do now in our laboratories unless there is good clinical data, but that doesn't actually help the patient. And so the real importance of the education is about trying to make sure that people do complete the swab forms correctly because they don't get processed and the patient often, there is a delay in um, providing the appropriate treatment. If you're waiting for a swab result before you treat, there are different schools of thought on that, or whether you start to treat and then you change the intervention. But in some cases, patient, uh, some staff won't treat um, without the swab result, and that can delay. So there's probably two, two or three different ways of thinking about that. Which is probably also an extension of the fact that audits have shown that if you go around the hospital and look at patients on antibiotics, the reason why they're on antibiotics is actually often not documented properly in, in the notes. So I think it's just more of the same phenomenon. Okay.